Good morning. Please welcome Brian Kowalczyk to the stage. Good morning, and welcome to the final day of the 2024 AIAA SciTech Forum. I hope you've enjoyed this week as much as I have. I am Brian Kowalczyk, co-director of the Applied Autonomy Lab and senior research associate for Digital Futures at the University of Cincinnati. I am also the incoming chair of the AIAA Young Professionals Group, and I am honored to serve as the AIAA Guiding Coalition. Today, we'll be announcing the awards for the best papers student papers that were presented during this week's forum. I'd like to ask Dr. Leslie White's Chief of the Technical Activities Division to join me on stage to present these awards. <clears throat> the following student paper competition awards will be presented to the winners where a single paper can only win one award. Our first set of student paper competition comes from the Aerospace Design and Structures Group. The highest ranked composites related paper based on manuscript and presentation quality is recognized by the American Society for Composites Student Paper Award. The recipient receives a $500 cash prize. <clears throat> the winner is Kartik Bodapati from Purdue University with the winning paper on the loss of stability of bistable laminates due to clamping. Congratulations and thank you to the American Society for Composites for their support. Next is the Harry H. and Lois G. Hilton Student Paper Award in Structures. This award is part of an endowed student paper competition made possible by AIAA fellow Harry Hilton and his wife Lois. This award recognizes outstanding graduate level structures related paper based on manuscript and presentation quality. The recipient receives a $500 cash prize. The winner is Amir Farzam, Virginia Polytech Institute and State University. With the winning paper of first ply failure load of laminated and sandwich plates using isogeomeric analysis. Next, the Lockheed Martin Student Paper Award in Structures recognizes as outstanding structure-related paper based on manuscript and presentation quality. The recipient receives a $500 cash prize. The winner is Michelle Rudd from Delft University of Technology. With the winning paper of buckling behavior for conical cylindrical shells and design considerations for launch vehicle applications. Congratulations and thank you to Lockheed Martin Corporation for your support. Our next award is the Southwest Research Institute Student Paper Award in Non-Deterministic Approaches. This award recognizes an outstanding NDA-related paper based on manuscript and presentation quality. The recipient receives a $500 cash prize. The winner is Bing, Wong, Bing Rang Wong from the University of California, San Diego with the winning paper a gradient enhanced univariate dimension reduction method for uncertainty propagation. Congratulations and thank you to the Southwest Research Institute for your support. <clears throat> the Jefferson Goblet Student Paper Award is the highest ranked aerospace design and structures paper based on manuscript and presentation quality. It was established over 20 years ago and named to honor Thomas Jefferson. The recipient receives a $500 cash prize and a goblet modeled after a 19, or 1788 designed by Thomas Jefferson. The winner is Rowan Glenn from the University of California, Davis, with the winning paper, a novel approach to analyzing bird wing morphology using slicing functions. Congratulations. Our next student paper competition award is sponsored by the Green Engineering Technical Committee. The overall winner of the Green Engineering Best Student Paper Award is Waranasi Sayi Subankar from the University of Texas at Austin. With the paper, 
breaking catalytic scaling constraints using plasma-enabled catalysts of methane and decarbonized hydrogen production. Congratulations. Our next student paper competition award is sponsored by the AIAA Guidance Navigation and Control Technical Committee. This Guidance Navigation and Control best graduate student paper is based on several GNC technical re research topics. All finalists in this competition receive a monetary award of $500 and complimentary registration. The overall winner will receive an additional $1,000 award. The winner is Julia Bryden from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with the winning paper, Improving Computational Efficiencies for Powered Descent Guidance via transform, Transformer-Based Tight Constraint Prediction. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next student paper competition award is sponsored by the AIAA Intelligent Systems Technical Committee. The winner of the Intelligent Systems Student Paper Competition is Cynthia Koopman from the University of Malta with the winning paper, Using Reinforcement Learning for AI Systems in the Mitigation of Automation Failures and Stall Recovery in Complex Aircraft. Congratulations. <clears throat> Our next student paper competition award is sponsored by the AIAA Space Tethers Technical Committee. The winner of their student paper competition is Derek Bertaba from the University at Buffalo with the winning paper, Online Control and Moment of Inertia Estimation for Tethered Debris. Congratulations. Our final student competition awards are the Abe Zabram Awards. The Zabram Graduate Student Awards have been established by AAA and Dr. Abe Zabram as means for students pursuing advanced degrees, master level candidates in aeronautics and astronautics to showcase their talent and work. It is hoped that these award awards will not only identify talented students, but also motivate and encourage more students to seek advanced degrees in these areas and thus start to fill the void that has worried educators for many years. The 2023 Abe Zerum Award Grad Graduate Award for Distinguished Achievement in Astronautics goes to Quentin Roberts, University of Washington, with his winning paper, Investigation of Pre-Ignition Propellant Mixing and Rotating Detonation Rocket Engines. <clears throat> his advisor is Dr. Carl Nowen. The 2023 Abe Zerum Graduate Award for Distinguished Achievement in Aeronautics goes to Stephen Moore, Monroe, sorry, uh, from Clarkson University with his winning paper, Parallel Unsteady Reynolds Average Navier Stokes Studies on the Performance of ONR Water Jet AXW2. His advisor, Dr. Shunling Lang, Dr. Marcias Martinez is accepting on Dr. Lang's certificate. Both Stephen Monroe and Quentin Roberts will receive a funded trip to present their research at the upcoming International Astronomical Congress, a funded trip to present their research at the upcoming International Council of Aeronautical Sciences, held every other year, as well as a funded trip to this AAA SciTech Forum. Congratulations. And Craig, <clears throat> congratulations again to all the student paper winners. Turning now to our program, today we'll conclude the forum by imagining the future of the aerospace engineer. Whether you're just starting out your career or enjoying retirement, I know you'll find today's discussion fascinating as we consider how engineers of the future will help us expand the boundaries. <clears throat> this session this morning is moderated by Lieutenant General Larry James, Deputy Director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Larry's been JPL's Deputy Director since 2013, at JPL, he is the laboratory's chief operating officer responsible to the director for day-to-day -day operations management of JPL's resource and activities. This includes managing the laboratory's solar system exploration, Mars, astronomy, physics, earth sciences, interplanetary network programs, and all business operations. I'd like to ask Larry and our speakers, Dr. Mark Mayberry and Dr. Karen Wilcox, to join us on the stage. As they're joining us, I'd like to remind our audience that you can ask our, uh, 
our speaker's questions using the R code shown on the screen. Please join me in welcoming this morning's speakers. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, how's everyone doing? I mean, you are the stalwarts in that you are here on the last day of the conference at 8 a.m., so my congratulations to you. Well done. Um, also, I think we need to give a round of applause to Brian for getting through all those names and topics. <laughs> okay, I need to find the clicker. Oh, it's here. Ah, there we go. Okay, let's see if... Uh... All right, we'll go back. There we go. Okay, great. So uh, again, good morning, and uh, as Brian said, uh, we're excited to be here to really talk about thinking about the future of the aerospace engineer. But you know, I did look up a couple of topics. How many of you have heard of Yogi Berra? Okay, about 2% maybe. <laughs> Scott, that says something about us, right? Uh, but Yogi Berra had a great quote. It said, it's difficult to make predictions especially about the future. So uh, I think you know, we're trying to do a little bit of that here today, but uh, we're excited to do that. I also thought an, a great other quote is, uh, the future is shaped by your dreams. So stop wasting time and go to sleep. So don't do that, don't do that this morning. I hope you've all had your coffee. So again, just uh, some brief introductory remarks before we get to our panelists and I'll be introducing them. But, uh, Aviation Week did a study back around 2020 to look at what does the future environment look like, what does the future workforce look like, and I just wanted to really highlight some of the things that they brought out. I don't think any of these will be a surprise to us, but again, I think it was done across the industry to say, okay, what are people thinking, what, are leadership, what is leadership thinking about this? First of all, they said, look, uh, it's going to be very dynamic. The operating models for our organizations, for our industries is going to be very dynamic. Uh, there's going to be a high leverage, of course, of technology and process improvement that we're all, I think, dealing with every day as we look around us. Uh, and also, there's going to be an increasing focus on leadership in terms of leadership that is adaptive, leadership that is learning intelligent, and leadership that is able to navigate the success of teams through inspiration. And I think even at JPL, we've seen how the quality of leadership has had to change, how leaders lead their people has had to change. And so I think all those things start to meld together in terms of what does the future look like uh, for aerospace engineers, both on the technical side, on the leadership and management side. So again, if you look at the landscape, I just wrote down a few things I kind of, you know, fr frankly talked to a bunch of people at JPL as well as surveyed the internet and said, What's out there that's going to drive this environment? And of course, I don't think any of these will be a surprise, but we're all living in the domain of commercial space or new space. Uh, you know, we kind of coined that term a few years ago. I think now it's just, it's the real space, right? It's kind of what's happening all around us. Space tourism is becoming a thing, and I think in the lifetime of many young aerospace engineers, that's gonna be really taking off. Uh, you have sustainability. Uh, that is a big thing for the industry, especially in air transportation, and so how does that affect what the future looks like? Uh, you're gonna hear, I think, some good words on AI, machine learning, large language models. We're all, you know, it's kind of the buzzword today, but I was talking to Mark beforehand, and uh, I think you got your degree back in what year in this field? <laughs> it was more than 20 years ago, I'll say that. So, 36. Uh, so it's not like this is a new thing, I mean, but it's suddenly become into the consciousness of the broader society. So what does that really mean? Uh, so we're gonna be thinking about all of that. But I think too for us at JPL, we're finding that you know, having that interdisciplinary capability so you can't really just stay focused in a particular area as you move up into, the, into your career and into the projects. So how do you think about this whole interdisciplinary capability that, that will frankly require you to continue to be a lifelong learner and really expand your horizons on where we are going to be? So I'm not gonna hit all of those, but you know, just framing this environment as we look maybe five, 10, 15 years into the future and try to do some prediction of what that future looks like. Looks like. So now I'd just like to introduce our incredible speakers. Uh, uh, 
Dr. Karen Wilcox is the director of the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, she also holds a, a number of chairs there and those sorts of things. Uh, she's an external professor of the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, she holds the Tex Moncrief Chair in Simulation-Based Engineering and Sciences. Uh, she served as the founding co-director of the MIT Center for Computational Engineering and she was the associate head of MIT Departments of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So just a, a great distinguished career. And she and I also serve on the AAA board together, so just a great friend. So Karen, thank you and welcome. Um, and then we have Dr. Mark Mayberry. He's currently the Vice President of Commercialization, Engineering and Technology at Lockheed Martin. And again, an incredible career. Uh, before that, he was the uh, first Chief Technology Officer of Stanley Black and Decker. Uh, so uh, really driving them into the future from a technology perspective. And uh, Mark and I got to know each other when we served on the air staff together when he was the Chief Scientist of the Air Force. And so uh, I won't go through all of his bio, but again, just incredible people who have brought incredible thinking to the role of the aerospace engineer and where we are headed in the future. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen and she's gonna provide some opening remarks followed by Mark. And again, I remind you, uh, please submit your questions. I'll be monitoring those and uh, you can certainly help us engage in the dialogue once the opening comments are complete. So uh, Karen, over to you. All right, uh, well thanks very much, Larry, and uh, it's really an honor to be here with you all this morning and uh, imagine the aerospace engineer of tomorrow. So I have just a few minutes of uh, opening remarks, really trying to seed a few thoughts that I hope we can build on in the, the discussion that we're going to have. There we go. All right, so you probably recognize this photo. This is one of my favorite uh, photos from the, the NASA collection, the famous Earthrise. Uh, this photo was taken in December of 1968, so just gone uh, 55 years since this photo was taken. And uh, throughout my career, uh, I've often wished that I was born maybe 40 years earlier, that instead of finishing my PhD in 1999, I had finished it in 1959. And uh, I can remember my very first year teaching on the faculty at MIT, where I was put in a class teaching the controls class together with Wynn Markey and John Deist, and they would tell these stories about the work they did on the Apollo program. And again, I really wished, I thought, oh, if only I had been born earlier. And I don't know if some of, some of you in the audience sort of share that sentiment. But if we fast forward 55, 56 years, and uh, think about the year 2024, where we are now. Get the actual where I'm supposed to, there we go. Uh, you know, what, what an incredible time to be an aerospace engineer. And yes, I'm sure it was an amazing time to be an aerospace engineer in the 1960s. But if we think about where we stand now in 2024, with the prospect of humans going back to the moon, and not only humans going back to the moon, but humans uh, that represent a broader, broader swath of society, you think of all the children, all the boys and the girls who are gonna see themselves in the astronauts that were returned to the moon. That alone is, just makes it an incredibly exciting time. But that's not all. We're also seeing, and we saw that incredible uh, video as we walked in this morning, of uh, the human race starting to explore other planets. And then here on Earth, we see a revolution in mobility, in air transportation, in what uh, aviation, and more broadly, aerospace, is doing for our, our planet, for our society here. So it is an absolutely incredible time to be an aerospace engineer. And while part of me wishes that I'd been born 40 years earlier, part of me also wishes I'd been 40 years later, born 40 years later, because I just think about everything that's going to come in the coming years. And uh, I'm also thrilled that here at SciTech, we have so many of the young people here who are really going to lead us uh, into, that, into that future. So it's a really exciting time. Oh, did I go? There we go. I'm not really sure where I'm supposed to be pointing this thing. I don't know, maybe raise it up. <laughs> um, where the computer is. All right, I'm not sure. All right, so what does it take to, uh, to really make all these things happen? Aerospace engineering, as we all know, has really drawn on multiple disciplines. And uh, one of the challenges as an, as an aerospace educator that we have always grappled with is how do we cram all these 
pieces, all these disciplines, into uh, a tiny four years of an undergraduate degree. That problem, and we heard this from Larry, that problem is only getting worse. It's only getting worse. The aerospace engineer of tomorrow needs even more tools in their toolbox. The traditional disciplines, the fluids, the structures, the propulsion, the controls, the importance of those things is not going away. It has not gone away, but we're adding more and more uh, both technical topics and also some of those other things, the need for leadership, for teamwork, uh, for thinking about ethics, for thinking about societal impact. This is a, a real, real challenge, and I hope that's something that we can touch on in our discussion. Uh, as I think about the future, and I think about the aerospace engineer of tomorrow, I always find it helpful to think about where we are. I guess that's the engineer or the mathematician in me. Uh, if I'm going to extrapolate, I want to see the data points of where we've come from. Uh, so I asked some of the AAA staff to pull data uh, from SciTech over the years, and if we wind back 10 years ago to SciTech 2014, uh, and that, by the way, that was the first SciTech, that was the first sort of Uber conference uh, where many of the, the smaller conferences were combined. Uh, there were almost 2,000 abstracts and about 1,500 presentations. And you can see there the five topics, the top five topics for the abstracts. And of course, uh, it looks quite a lot like a required core of an aerospace engineering undergraduate degree, as you might, might expect. Uh, let's fast forward to this meeting, to SciTech 2024. Okay, there we go. So uh, 4,000 abstracts, 3,000 presentations, and almost exact doubling of the size. And that in itself, that's amazing. And you have that sense just walking around the halls here at this conference. Again, this is such an exciting time to be an aerospace engineer. The conference is buzzing. And those numbers alone, uh, I think, speak to the excitement and the opportunity. And then looking at the top five topics for abstracts, so fluid dynamics, applied aerodynamics, and guidance navigation and control still there as the top three. But look at uh, what's taken in the number four and five slots, spaceflight mechanics and intelligent systems. And maybe that comes as no surprise, but it's kind of remarkable to think back just 10 years ago when space and intelligent systems weren't at the level yet of, of uh, rising up. So I think this is... Uh, sort of one indicator of the change that is taking place and is going to continue in the, in the future. If we dig down uh, just a, uh, uh, a little further, um, thanks to the, AAA, the amazing AAA staff for pulling out some data on presentation keywords. So these are keywords that appeared in paper titles or in session titles. And so one is the keyword autonomy or autonomous. And in 2014, there were 17 session titles or papers with that word, autonomy, or the word autonomous in them. SciTech today, 173, so a 10x increase. Again, maybe that comes as no, no surprise, but it's, it's an incredible shift. Uh, the word digital, five in 2014 and 57, again, a 10x increase uh, in 2024. This is a good one. Uh, how, many, how many times do you think the phrase machine learning appeared in uh, 2014 in a zero? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's sort of mind-boggling, right? You walk around. How, like, what, what, what were we, what were we, what, 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 I guess we were calling it regression and optimization in 2014, and now we call it machine learning. We can debate that, we can debate that later. Um, we weren't calling it generative AI, I guess. <laughs> that one's coming. All right, uh, the word intelligent or intelligence, seven to 43, and again, you saw intelligent systems rising up there. And then I think the last one is uh, artificial intelligence. So you guessed the machine learning one, Scott, you got it. Uh, so again, zero in 2014 and 76. And this is just the, the papers with the, the term actually in the, in the title or in the session title. So this is, this is huge, huge change. Uh, it brings, of course, really, so many, so many challenges, how do we do all this? But uh, as I was putting together these slides, you know, where will SciTech 2034 be? What will the top five topics be? What will the papers look like? What will be the challenges that we're considering? It's really, really exciting to think about that, and uh, I really look forward to hearing your questions and having the discussion. Thank you. Karen, thank you. I think that really does set the stage. I've already got a ton of questions here based on what you just said, but uh, Mark, please uh, continue. All right, thank you. Flicker. 
So good morning, uh, and first off, uh, let me congratulate Larry for over a decade of service uh, in his organization. Uh, JPL, obviously, one of the leading, uh, not only, not only national, but international organizations to address the very to last, second to last topic that Karen showed there, right, the future in space. Also, uh, congratulations to AIA, uh, just an amazing turnout post-COVID, uh, and uh, um, we at Lockheed Martin are, are really um, honored uh, to be uh, a long-term uh, contributor to AIA. Um, we are committed to the organization. Uh, we actually, through our corp commitment, provide 500 memberships uh, to AIA, 350 of which we commit to young professionals. Because uh, it's not, you know, I don't have a gray beard like Scott Foose in the front, front row here. Um, but I got a little bit of gray hair, mostly due to my kids and grandkids. Um, but importantly, it's the young professionals, and we'll talk more about those as we go today. Um, so congratulations. Um, uh, we have uh, over 100 registered folks from Lockheed Martin from all of our businesses uh, here uh, this week, uh, a number of them contributing to the technical committees. Um, something Karen said inspired me. Uh, you look at the, the data analytics she showed, and, and we talk, of course, if any of, of techies, and, uh, or uh, start trekkies, I should say, uh, in the audience. We talk about space as the final frontier. But note that artificial intelligence is, uh, machine intelligence is at the end, right? And indeed, I think just as futurists have said, the further out in the future you want to look in time, the further back you need to look in history if you want to forecast. The same can be true said of space. Uh, the further out we want to look in the universe, the closer in we need to look at ourselves. And I think, my projection uh, for the next 10 years is that not just machine intelligence or AI, but in 10 years, uh, we will think about uh, the final frontier not being space, but the final frontier being you, being us. Why do I say that? It's because, uh, indeed, I don't like to talk about artificial intelligence, AI. I like to, like to talk about something that Ginny Romney at IBM first coined, uh, perhaps others, uh, augmented intelligence. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but in my view, that's the future. And I feel so passionate about this, uh, I convinced over a, a decade our, our last child, uh, the young Julia Mabry, uh, to now be doing her PhD in nothing other than neuroscience, neuroscience of memory and aging. Why? Well, of course, it's important to neurodegenerative diseases, but it's also important to fundamentally understanding how the greatest machine, if you will, I don't think of us as a machine, the greatest being uh, entity ever created in history is us. But we, yet we know so very little about how we operate. So I think that's the key to the aerospace engineer of tomorrow. Um, we at Lockheed Martin, uh, you can see here the variety of technologies uh, represented here uh, at the conference this week. Uh, these are our laboratories. Uh, you can see actually we have an international laboratory. 30% of what we do in the company is actually done globally. Uh, when you, people think of an F-35 being produced on an over mile long manufacturing um, line <clears throat> in Texas, in fact actually it's produced all over the world. It's just integrated in Texas. Uh, so really now, uh, aerospace and defense is in fact a global activity. Uh, and so we have to think about, when we think about the future aer aerospace engineer, uh, for us Americans, it's going to be decreasingly American. It's going to be increasingly global. Uh, and we, of course, have to make sure that we, we engage and collaborate accordingly. Uh, if you're interested, uh, in fact, I think what, what we should do right now is maybe run the first video, uh, our forecast of actually what's going to happen this year in terms of what our contribution at Lockheed Martin is. So if you could run the 2024 video.
So I'm excited just about this year, not even to think about the next 10 years. Um, and one of the th challenges I'd have, especially to the young professionals, is think about how you collaborate outside your project, outside your department, outside your organization. Because in fact, the smartest people who are working on the, your area, apart from yourself, are people outside your organization. So build your networks now. You will discover they'll be very, very important for you across your career. Um, in a moment, we're just going to show you a little bit about uh, a little bit of fun I had before when I transitioned from Stanley Black & Decker uh, to Lockheed Martin, working with a Hollywood producer to put together a 10-minute uh, future, uh, actually past and future, about what AI, including generative AI, is going to look like. And I did it with a bunch of my friends uh, in, in, uh, in a variety of disciplines. Uh, and, and I encourage you to go off and, and, and look at the full video. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. One of the things that's important to appreciate is uh, there's a, a lot of talk about, well, AI is going to take my job away. And boy, I sure hope it does. <laughs> because uh, the promise of robots is we'll remove the dull, dirty, dangerous tasks. If you think about the slog you go through, whether it's planning your daily activity, whether it's doing data analytics, whether it's uh, forecasting, connecting to people, you want assistance for that. And you should not at all, nor should society, by the way, all of you are the privileged, none of your jobs, none of your employment's at risk, significantly service employment's at risk. Uh, for example, customer service uh, activities, because we can automate those. The good news, the good news is we have not one, not two, but three examples in history, there are probably do hundreds and dozens, we just haven't done the analysis, that show that revolutionary technology generates new jobs. It destroys them. Look at the PCs. We destroyed three and a half million jobs, right? Because we don't need people to type anymore. I took a typing class in high school so I could learn how to program faster, right? You don't have to do that today. That's a good thing. It created, as you can see, a net almost 60 million jobs. Artificial intelligence, by the way, is projected to generate uh, on the order of 10 to 15 million new jobs. I think that's actually generative AI. That's way under, uh, under, uh, understated. I think it's far greater than that. That's McKinsey's projection. Uh, and why do I believe that? Take a look at that slide to the right. That was done uh, as I was chief technologist of over 107 uh, factories around the world in 60 countries. We were introducing robots as fast as we could. Why? Because we had a million unfilled jobs in America alone, about 10 million globally manufacturing. We do not have enough people. We need more babies, right? We're not gonna get them. Uh, that's the reality. You shouldn't worry about overpopulation. Population slows as the world gets more educated, as the world gets wealthier. That's happening. What we should worry about is how we make sure we educate and empower the minds that we do have. Look at those companies, right? Over 10 years study of 1,900 manufacturers, those that didn't adopt robots reduced employment by 20%. Those that introduced robots increased employment by 50%. That gets the attention of economists. That gets the attention of CFOs. That got me lots of money at Stanley Black & Decker, right, to deploy robots, which we did responsibly. And that's another key is we'll get to that later, perhaps, responsible AI. Just want to conclude uh, by just saying a little bit about how we should do this. This is what we did at, uh, at, in the factories, is, and we do this actually at Lockheed Martin as well. We identify and reskill. Uh, first, we identify the work that needs to be done. We distribute it amongst the AIs digitally and or the physical robots. And then we focus on the people. And we say, what do those people need to do? Not what did they do in the past. What do they do, need to do in the future? They need to understand analytics. They need to have STEM backgrounds. They also need to collaborate in a more complicated world, not just with people, but also with robots. So first off, we have teach operators how to work alongside robots, increasingly collaborative robots. Uh, companies like Ready Robotics have shown uh, with a couple hours of training on very advanced, very intuitive interfaces, we can teach people to program robots, things that you need a PhD like me to do 10 years ago. We can teach them how to do that in two hours. Not just one robot, every manufacturer. Imagine that. Within two weeks, we've got folks who have the high school education who are programming robots on the floor. Incredible. No, it's actually good design. We then can evolve them to maintaining those robots, ultimately actually doing data analytics, uh, designing workflows, and in the end, supervising combined human robots team. At Stanley Black & Decker, in all of our plants, we had a human-robot ratio. Imagine that. 
Some plants it was one to one, some plants it was four to one. There are, of course, some plants in the world where it's one to a thousand, right? Uh, it just depends on the nature of the automation, but that's the way we need to think about the future. And we need to think about how we upskill, uh, not just all of us, the engineers, but also how do, we do, how, do we, how do we empower and democratize the line worker, those who aren't as privileged as us, so that they maintain and grow skills so that they can be, become more effective and more productive. Uh, and in the end, it's about understanding us. And we'll talk more about that, uh, but I'd like to turn things back to Larry. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, again, congratulations to AIA for, for the success that you've all had here. We're excited about the future. Um, yes, we're, we're excited about space. We're gonna be go helping uh, propel us to space in the next year, but we're also excited about us because we think that's actually the final frontier. Great, thank you, Mark. And again, uh... And uh, thanks for submitting all the questions. I have quite a few here. I'm gonna try to bundle some of these. Uh, but I think, Mark, in terms of, you showed the kind of the, the history of how do we get folks integrating with robotic capabilities. And there's a lot of dialogue on the chat here about you know all the disciplines an aerospace engineer may have to know. Uh, and then some questions, Karen, about how do we teach that you know, to prepare them for the workforce? And then how do we, continue to make sure that you know, they're learning throughout their career because the technology is gonna change. You know, one of the questions, how do we prepare our students to work with technologies or our employees that do not even exist yet? So along the lines of preparing students but also preparing the workforce, that interdisciplinary capability that we think is absolutely essential, how do you see that going forward, perhaps from the academic side but also from the industrial side? I can. So let me, let me uh, take a first cut at that. Um, so it's, it's a challenge, of course, but it's also incredibly exciting. Um, you know, as educators, we so often get caught up in the content, and I can remember many faculty debates over content and what goes in and what goes out. Uh, it's very hard to let go of that. And, you know, this, this question about how do, we, how do we educate students for technologies that don't even exist exists today, that's a reminder that we're not teaching people content. We're, thinking, we're teaching them how to think, uh, critical thinking, how to take a problem, how to break it apart, how to recognize when you have physical principles, uh, when you have sort of models that are coming to you from governing laws, when you don't, how to think about data, how to think about uncertainty, how to work in teams. And of course, we teach all of this in the context of very, very important content that relates to aerospace engineering. So I think, think, think about those, those uh, skill sets that underlie masquerading as classes in fluids and math is, is really essential. Uh, Larry, you know, you mentioned lifelong learning. That has to, be, has to be such an important part of our mindset going in. Four years is not even close to being enough. Nine years, if you <laughs> stay for graduate school, even that's not enough. <laughs> Uh, so lifelong learning, and I think this is where professional organizations like AAA have an incredible role to play. And even looking at the program here at SciTech, it's kind of a microcosm of that challenge of the four-year undergraduate degree, because there are so many interesting papers going on and you can't go to them all. What do you do? You go to some of them and then the others you, you visit sort of asynchronously. Uh, and then maybe, maybe the, the last point is, I, I really do think, well, actually, I have to make two, two, two more last points. One is, uh, we're talking a lot about AI, machine learning, computation, robotics. Those topics, of course, they're important, but they cannot replace what's, what we might call the traditional, traditional disciplines. Mm. And I really want to make sure that in the discussion and in our excitement about especially AI, that we don't lose the importance of education in the fundamentals in physics, because without those, and maybe Mark and I can arm wrestle over this later, no matter how intelligent our systems come, our, I, I really truly believe the humans have to deeply understand the, the physics for complex systems. Um, and then, then just the last, the last point, I really do think there is a need for new kinds of degrees. So part of the answer is that aerospace engineering undergraduate degrees need to morph and adapt and maybe become more flexible. But another part is there is a need for new degrees. And one of the things I love about UT Austin, very uniquely, our aerospace engineering department actually offers two undergraduate degrees. One is in aerospace engineering and the other is in computational engineering. 
and the computational engineering degree is turning out engineers who maybe don't have as many classes in fluids, propulsion, structures, the aerospace disciplines, but have more training in computation, but are, are really engineers none, nonetheless. I mean, it really is a fantastic interdisciplinary degree. And so more thinking like that, how do we elevate computational engineering and making it more than just engineers tagging on to uh, AI and machine learning, I think that's really important. And I'll just segue a little bit off of that last point because we found at JPL, you know, frankly, when we do these incredible projects, uh, we found in the past our project managers have grown up, I would say, on the hardware side. They've built instruments, they've managed instruments, and they've managed systems, but it's really been kind of the hardware focus for a project manager. But the reality is, I love the little uh, saying that I read somewhere, how software is eating the car, which if you, if you own a Tesla, you know it's all about a software platform, but it's also eating our spacecraft, if you will. I mean, if you look at the lines of code and, and software and the importance of that, frankly, we've found that most of our project engineers, you know, at the top level today, didn't come out of the software world and don't necessarily have that digital software framework for management. So your point of how do you really think about that in a different way in a digital world for us is very important, and we're trying to think through that in terms of who is a good project manager. But Mark, I'll turn it over to you. With yeah, I agree entirely with everything Karen said uh, in, in the sense that, uh, so I apologize for not going to spark. We can spark perhaps other things. <laughs> um, it, so, so, so we hired 6,500 young professionals last year. Um, we, can, we, we, uh, we convert uh, higher than the industry average of our interns to, to employees. We have a lot of experience with transition from a, a, a academia into industry. Um, and everything Karen said is absolutely right. We care a lot about competence, right, more than degrees. It's what you can do. Uh, and there's even new universities, like University of Southern New Hampshire, which invert the, the, the actual uh, a, a, academic education process. I will also say that, uh, and I see Greg Zacharias in, in, in the audience, uh, good, good colleague, former chief scientist of the Air Force, um, uh, he and I know this, the intelligent tutoring system uh, field in AI, uh, decades ago, discovered that collaborative learning and personalized learning actually gives you two sigma faster learning. So what we need is we need all of you to look at more scientific measures, objective measures of how effective learning is and how resilient learning is. It, because actually what you learn in industry is you have to not only learn, you have to unlearn. Uh, and you have to learn to learn. That's, th that's actually the goal that we get from academia, is we get students who actually have a passion for learning, right? They have a passion for discovery. They're not afraid of the big hag, the big, big hairy blank uh, you know, challenge. Uh, they, they're, they, they're, they're motivated, they're attracted to that because they want, with teams, because uh, as Karen said, you need that, multi, uh, that multidisciplinary <laughs> foundation. So you absolutely need the competence, but you also need the freedom uh, and the skills to discover, to learn, uh, because that's partly what your job is to do, not just to execute, but also to discover the better, uh, more effective. And, and that, that, that's a mindset, right? That's a, that's a mindset. Uh, and I'll tell you, it's even true at the executive level. What we learn from the very best leaders is humility. We learn that we cannot predict the f future. We can, we can try to create it, and oftentimes we do, but we have to appreciate that if we as individuals or organizations want to be better, we have to want to be better than we are. So that, that, that's humility, and that, that means that if the, the academia gives us the tools to be lifelong learners, right? And, and by the way, those are both technical ones, and I'm sure we'll get to this, but they're also very soft, much soft skills. I like to say, you know, it's been said by others as well, that the hard skills are the soft skills. Why? Right? Because you are not going to do it alone. You're going to do it with us. You've got to collaborate. You are going to have to learn to read, read to learn. You're going to have to learn to communicate very effectively. So these soft skills turn out to be really the superpowers of what? Of the most powerful tool. I was in the tool business for five years. I made literally millions of tools for other people to empower them physically. And what were we doing? We were making those tools more intelligent. Why? So that the humans could become more productive. And how? By paying attention to the human. Do we think they're getting tired? Not the tool, the human. 
right? Are they attending to the task or are they about to cut their, cut their finger, right? So, so we need to actually empower those humans, and, and uh, Dr. Zacharias knows this, and others uh, like Scott and others who've worked in AI for their whole careers know this, is that that's the, really the final frontier, and, and academia can critically help us get to, get to that, to those skills. Perfect. Well, I'm gonna segue off of that a bit because as you look at <clears throat> COVID and the impacts of COVID, frankly, on the workforce and how we think about work and virtual environments and remote environments, you know, one of the questions was, you know, how does that really impact our ability to do aerospace engineering? How does that impact our ability to work in teams and to learn, uh, especially when, you know, uh, many, uh, I would say, uh, young engineers say, hey, I, do want to, I want to have the flexibility to work remotely, which reduces the amount of time you're doing face-to-face -face and maybe that mentoring ship that comes in person. So I'll ask you, Mark, first, I mean, how are we thinking about that for the future? Because there is a desire to have that capability, but also I think there's perhaps the negative side of less personal interaction, less mentoring, less opportunity to just walk down the hall and talk to someone and pick their brain. So. How do you see that playing out and how do we make it successful utilizing the tools perhaps that we've just talked about? Virtual collaboration is physical absence. We need to understand that. And to your point, Larry, um, the great thing is we have things that uh, and our kids have things we didn't have. Some of us, a few of us in the audience are Digirati. We were born in the digital world. My first email address was an ARPANET. I happened to be on the first three nodes, right? So I was lucky, right? But I'm different, right? Uh, the majority go goodness is of our children are born in that environment. So they know what it means to have friends all over the world. But what they don't necessarily have, some of them are building it intuitively, but the leaders need to give them, and even academia needs to give us, the tools to pay attention to their physical well-being, pay attention, of course, to their cognitive well-being, but also to their psychological well-being. And what we've discovered during COVID is, especially with our young professionals, right, um, anxiety, depression skyrocketed, right? Just look at the just look at the online measures the, the amount of prescriptions that occur, right? And so that's not a good thing. Could we have mitigated that? As leaders, one of the things I personally did is I would hold virtual coffee hours. Why? Not for me, although actually it turned out it really benefited me too. Uh, but the young professionals, you know, you hire one of those 6,500 new interns. They show up and they're supposed to help produce an F-35 or an F-22, right? F-16, they can't, they maybe have to go to the plant to do certain things, but the engineers are now stuck at home. So they don't meet that foreman. She's got 25 years of experience and says, whatever you do, make sure that you anticipate how you can impact the line worker, right? They don't get that feedback. And so they miss that cognitive and emotional development. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what we have to do is, create, as leaders, we have to create environments. One, we have to pay attention, right? How are you doing today, right? Uh, have you seen your family? How's your family doing? Um, uh, did, did you, did, are you aware of the data that I put out? One of the things I do as a leader now is I very intentionally make it easy for others to do their job. I, I didn't do that as intentionally before COVID. And so I think we learned a lot of lessons in COVID about how do I, uh, and, and that's both individually. Like, um, I literally learned how to meditate during COVID. And before that, I would say, you know, that's for crazy people, right? <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, my, I saw my daughter meditate, and I said, what are you doing, right? And she said, well, I'm, I'm getting ready for the day. And I was like, well, how's that work? She's like, do you know how to square breathe, Dad? I'm like, what do you mean square breathe? I, I breathe in and out. And so she taught me how to calm my body. It helps me in sports, it helps me in the day. And so I think um, we need to, again, create that, 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 in, that, that, that interest uh, in the creativity that will help address this new environment. And I think it can actually make us more powerful because then we can, just like if we design our, our environments for robots or humans, we should be thinking about for the humans, how do we design our environments for virtual and physical so we maximize it so that I can actually participate as I did yesterday in a virtual meeting with the leadership of the company, and yet I can do it and still be here with you today. Okay. Karen, any thoughts from the yeah. academic preparation side or even in the world of academia? Yeah, in the, in the, well, maybe more generally in the world. So, uh, I mean, absolutely, the, the virtual collaboration tools we have are amazing, and the fact that they can enable you to be in two places at one time 
That, that's wonderful, the, the fact that uh, young people can have flexible work options. Again, this is incredible. It can solve two body problems. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of pros. And one thing the pandemic has done for us, not just better virtual tools, but also a shift in mindsets and a willingness for leadership to, to uh, accept that. But uh, to any of the, the young and mid-career people out there, uh, I would really, really encourage you to not underestimate the value of physical interactions. I think it's very easy to look at people who are further on in their career and look at their career path and think that it was all mapped out from the beginning. I often get asked by young people, you know, your career has just been this beautiful, smooth path. How did you plan all this out? And the answer is I didn't plan any of it. And so many of the most influential and most important things that knocked me on different parts of my career happened because of accidental collisions at conferences, at workshops, in the workplace. Uh, you know, my, my group is right now working, we're collaborating with oncologists to build digital twins for cancer patients using the methods that we developed to build digital twins of a UAV. That, that kind of collision and accidental collaboration would never, never happen if you would live in a virtual world where you do go to the office, but you go to the office on scheduled days and you interact with your own group. So I love the, more, the flexibility that we have from the virtual world but uh, I, I can't tell you how happy I am to see so many people here at SciTech because the people that you meet here and the physical interactions that you have, especially the ones that you haven't planned out, you will be amazed how in tw 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time, you will look back and recognize that there was something that, that happened that, that really made a difference. So I, I really hope that um, you know, we can continue to make the most of the flexibility but not lose that physical interaction. Yeah. And again, just an exemplar for us from JPL. I mean, many of you have seen the Psyche model out in the, the lobby there, but you probably may also know that we delayed the Psyche launch for a year because frankly, we had a bunch of issues that we couldn't get our arms around, especially in the GNNC world. But as we peeled that back and we had an independent review come and look at that, and one of the things they found was a lot of this development was done during COVID. It was people, you know, not necessarily in the office or on the lab floor, but trying to work virtually. And, and there was just this lack of informal communication that goes so far when you're having these two body collisions that you didn't anticipate or you're just talking to someone. One of the review board members commented on how he went to the cafeteria coming out of COVID and there was virtually no one there. And then as we came out of COVID, you know, it was suddenly full again. And he said, you know, that is your informal safety net. That is people dialoguing, that is people getting together randomly, that is people overhearing something that triggers a thought. And he said, without that informal safety net, you are at risk. So there is this balance, I think, that we're all gonna have to adjust to, but I think at least for us, having that personal, at least mostly day-to-day -day interaction is just so important in developing and operating these extremely complex systems that will be our future. So uh, there is that. <laughs> so. Um, uh, I'm going to also, uh, several questions, uh, kind of the elephant in the room uh, in terms of, well, gee, what is chat GPT and large language models going to do to our industry and how do I need to prepare for that? Uh, maybe on the academic side in terms of preparing folks, but certainly, Mark, you've lived this world. Uh, we'll turn to you second, but uh, Karen, maybe your thoughts initially. Yeah, well, I have lots of opinions on this topic, but I'm very nervous <laughs> expressing them when I sit next to a true expert. Um, <laughs> uh, Just so, remember, uh, the, the, the expert literature tells us that experts are wrong 50% of the time. <laughs> so just, you know, you're, 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 you're in good, yeah. good hands. So, you know, on, on the preparation side, and, you know, I alluded to this a little bit in the opening remarks, I mean, of course, it's important to prepare students for a world in which machine learning and AI are, are playing, a, playing a big role, but uh, not to diminish the importance of the opportunity and, and, and those technologies, let's also not forget that at some level they are regression and optimization. They are a set of computational techniques that engineers have used for a long time. There are many really exciting new things around you know, mathematical representations, the ability to ingest data at real scale, you know, algorithms that sort of go beyond, a, a, certainly go beyond a, a simple linear fit. But the, the principles um, are, are very common to, to things that are quite familiar with us. 
And so, again, back to this point that we're not teaching students content, and we certainly can't be teaching what happens to be flavor of the month in uh, you know, a, a regression or an optimization or a machine learning algorithm, but teaching them how to think critically uh, and how, how to teach themselves how to learn about whatever new algorithms are coming on the horizon. I mean, I think this is the way we have to approach, approach it in, in education. How things like chat GPT might, uh, might, might change our world. Of course, academia is struggling with this, uh, just as, as uh, industry is, as to what is appropriate use of large language models. And um, uh, you know, I really hope, we, we, we hear a lot about AI, uh, especially machine learning, scientific machine learning, giving us tools that will replace our traditional physics-based modeling. I really wish we would talk less about that and more about how AI could make better the parts of our jobs that we all hate. And I'm sure all of us sitting here today could think whether you're an academic or whether you're you know, in a lab or whether you're in, in industry, most of us love being aerospace engineers, but there are parts of our jobs that we really don't enjoy. And probably for most of us, it's got something to do with writing or with dealing with different data streams and you know, getting this code to talk to this code. I really wish that we would talk more about what AI could do for those parts of our role and kind of leave the physics alone uh, for, for a little bit. But um, over to the expert. Can I be creative and answer with a one minute video? Yes, I, I, to play? I hope can, you do can that. Can the AV guys play the uh, AI segment? This is just a little, a little brief clip from the 10 minute video. Uh, and it's actually targeted at next gen uh, to encourage them to go into AI, if they, if they can play that. This is actually funded by the Air Force. Mantel supported it. AI ML is becoming a huge thing, especially in the research field. But machine learning itself is really hard for people to understand. Even the people who design them can't necessarily explain them to you. It's kind of defined as the ability of machines to perform tasks that require human intelligence. And the AI model is supposed to be a representation for something in the real world, like a problem or like a way to solve a problem. In terms of even understanding what AI is, a system that's designed to actually make decisions that were typically left to human intelligence. They log into the Netflix and Hulu. How does it automatically know a guy should be watching this TV show or this movie next, right? That recommendation engine built on AI. AI ML is really cool, and there's a ton of different applications we could use it for. AI doesn't have to be complex, because it can be really simple and still create remarkable improvements in our lives. What should we learn to get ready for this new world? How will these new tools impact how we live? To understand where we are, let's look at where we began. In less than a century, humanity mastered the depths of the oceans, soared into the air, and extended our reach to space. Artificial intelligence it applies to everything, from art to music to movement. If you think about artificial intelligence not as being a machine-based intelligence, but rather as augmenting the intelligence of the human, it now becomes a much more powerful tool. The true value is not in replacing humans, it's in augmenting intelligence to enable us to be uh, better selves. I'm Dr. Mark Mabry, the 33rd Chief Scientist of the United States Air Force, the first Chief Technology Officer, Stanley Black & Decker, and currently a Vice President at Lockheed Martin. I've had the distinct pleasure of spending over 40 years learning and applying artificial intelligence to a whole variety of mission areas throughout my career. So I, th I think, uh, just to echo something Karen said, uh, it's really going to be how we change uh, and, and accelerate our own human learning. That's gonna be the real magic. And, and generative AI can help explore hypotheses. Yes, it can help write your essay, or actually better, improve your essay and learn from it. And, but in short, all generative AI today is, is a 80 to 100 billion parameter mirror. It's a very sophisticated mirror of human knowledge. What that means is that you're not gonna see anything more than yourself or others in it. So if you wanna see the future in it, you're gonna have to be really clever. Um, and so that, that's, that's my challenge to all of us, is, is let's go beyond the mirror, um, let's leverage the, the mirror, 
but we want to create a better mirror as we go forward. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, that brings us to uh, our time today in terms of wrapping up. But again, I hope we've at least hit some of the big topics that we're all thinking about and simulated some ideas in terms of what that future could look like for an aerospace engineer. I will say I've been in a couple of, of discussions here where we talked about the golden age as you did back in the 60s. This truly is a golden age for space and for the aerospace engineer. And for those who are uh, you know, going through their schooling right now, you have an incredible career ahead of you. Uh, I really wanna thank AIAA for all that they do for this industry, for our students, and really helping to drive us forward and, and that commitment to lifelong learning. So uh, thank you for being an incredible audience at 8 a.m. on the last day. I hope your last day is great and we look forward to continuing to work with you to drive uh, our nation forward and the world forward. So have a great day.